<coughs> Father, once again, we thank you that we've got a day that we can meet together to learn of your word. Lord, we all stand in need of thy word. I pray today you would teach me, teach everyone that hears this, teach everyone that participates your holy word. Fill in those voids and gaps in our lives. Polish those areas that are rough or fettered or splintered. Lord, do the work that only you can do. I pray today as we study more on being a good soldier or a soldier of the cross, as we're far from home, that you prepare us for this. And we just praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you got your Bibles, turn to 2 Timothy. We're continuing our study. We, uh, we worked on letters from home last week because, friends, we are just ambassadors. How often do we lose sight of the reality of our situation? We dig roots in. We want to establish something here. You know, because like Esau, who said, I'll never live long enough to see the blessings of God upon the Abrahamic promise. Many of us think, you know, that we're going to live our whole life here and, and we'll die. And then someday we'll be in heaven. You know, the rapture will happen, but probably not in our lifetime. One of the things the scripture says, you'll be able to identify the final and last days by, <clears throat> is that the children of God, will grow slack in looking for the return of their Savior. They will say, it's the church. Where's the return of his coming? You know, for 2,000 years we've been preaching this, but it just ain't happening. And you know, the more I've studied the book of Revelations, I don't believe we're plowing directly into it. I used to think that it was heavy, but I think it's going to be several years out, this transitional point. So I believe we've probably got quite a few years ahead of us before things really get where they are, and there might be some good years here. But what I do know is as Christians, we often lose sight of the fact that once you've gotten saved, you've given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you give your life to him, he doesn't give it back. It's not a, a temporary or a trial basis. I remember when I went in the military. It was a time when you shouldn't have gone in the military because whenever you're at war, <clears throat> you shouldn't send your kids to the military unless they really like to fight. But I'll never forget how when we got our orders to where we were going, there were quite a few young men that would break down bawling. i never seen such a crybabies in my life. And um, they just didn't want to do it. They joined the military, but they didn't realize they would actually have to go and do something with the military. They thought it was going to be a free ride and they would get their college and, you know, you'd get 25 grand in those days if you signed up. I never used mine. And then when I went to use it, they said, oh, you only had so many days to file for it. I went in for the college money and other things, but here's the deal. When you became a Christian, you gave your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's not going to give it back. But you joined a side. You know, it's kind of like on the schoolyard where you have two kids going to fight and everybody joins a side. There are a lot of people there that weren't on either side. They just like to see a fight. So they would keep shoving the people back together even though they don't want to fight. By not choosing a side, you've already chosen a side. You're against the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to get into this, starting about verse 6, and he is going to tell Timothy, he wants him to remember the reason why he's here still. The reason why God has chosen him. So my friend, as a soldier, you're going to get a lot of downtime. You're going to get 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, to where you can think about what you're supposed to do, where you can either prepare to be better at your, your gifts and your calling, or not. But you're going to have plenty of time to remember the things of God. Father, I pray once again and ask that you would bless this. In Christ Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Look, if you will, at verse 6. Wherefore, Timothy, I put thee in remembrance that you stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. You see, the gifts that Paul had were transferred into Timothy at a degree by the laying out of the hands of the presbyters. Like I told you last week, when I got ordained, those men would each come up one at a time, lay hands on me. My mind exploded. 
I don't know when or which one it was, but when I stood up, I had the gift of wisdom. I had the gift of knowledge. I had the gift of discernment of spirits. I'd look at people and could see the spirits around them. That's transferred. It's called the apostolic succession or ascension. Because Jesus ascended and he gave the gifts unto men, the apostles. And the apostles established the covenants of Christ, the doctrines of God, and the church. They had to have supernatural abilities in order to establish the church. But then after the apostles, you have prophets. They're the ones that teach the word of God that the apostles established. So, the apostles are passing on. Paul is handing the mantle down to this evangelist slash prophet, Timothy. So the first thing he does is he says, Timothy, I want you to remember. I want you to remember the things that God has done for you. Remember the joy he gave you in your life. Because the devil can't take your joy, you can give it up. People tell me, how can you be so joyous? It's the Spirit of God, maybe. I'm thankful. Maybe that's what it is. Jesus said the same thing. He says, remember from whence you are fallen. Remember the first works. Remember the love. Why would he do this? Not only in Revelations, but we read the same thing in the book of Hebrews. We read the same thing here. We read the same thing in Ephesus or the Ephesians. Awake thou that slumber, stir up. Why would God tell us in so many different places to remember and then stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands? A lot of the modern translations say fan the fire that is in thee. I do not agree with it, and I know this modern translation that many of my heroes, R.C. Sproul and others, pushed. And you say, well, why would they have done it if it wasn't necessary? Because for Presbyterians, they change the places where the word is baptizo. It means totally to be submerged, to rapto, sprinkled. So they would have a Bible for the Presbyterians for today. Well, my friend, <laughs> nobody tells the Holy Spirit what to do except God the Father the Son, and the Spirit. And they're all in agreement. Nobody has to tell them what to do. So I got news for you. The Holy Spirit ain't a fan fire inside of you. You can't make it grow bigger. You can't make it grow smaller. Put in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. You've got the gift whether you like it or not. Whether you use it or not. You can't lose the gift. The gift and the callings of God are without repentance. You say, well, what do you mean? If you can't lose the gift and you don't lose the gift, what happens? It's called the sin that results in your death. By refusing to use the gifts, it's like the farmer says, I want you to go and plow that field. There's the ox. You know where all the tools are. And you don't go plow the field. You don't do it the next day. You don't do it the next day. They didn't say, you know, I know you just don't like field work. <laughs> The oxen does smell when you're behind them. So we're going to let you just do whatever you want. No. The slave disobeyed the owner. The first time, they were punished horribly. The second time, they would probably be put to death. And you see, there's a sin that results in our deaths. It doesn't mean we're punished or whipped. But guess what? God does chastise you. He says... Chastisement, the book of Hebrews, begins in the house of God first. For all who are children shall suffer chastisement. And this is where the idea of the woodshed comes from. You've been given the gifts. You don't want to use it. God will punish you. How will he punish you? By simply removing his protection from you and allowing the devil, the demons, and others around you to be mean to you, to use you, to abuse you. I suffer all the time. It's because of sin in my life. God is just as good as he's always been. But if he gives you a gift, if he puts a tool in your hand, he expects you to go out and use that tool. 
He feeds you every day. Don't you wake up with energy, sight, hearing? We take all that for granted. Friends, if you're a soldier of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you are if you're born again, because everybody's involved in this war, that's why he has given you the armor of God. That is why he's given you the Bible as a means and direction so that you can live your life with God alone and not have to depend upon another person. Everything you need is in this book. <clears throat> but you need to stir up the gift that has been given into you. This last week I was studying gifts with one of my children and I'm wanting to help them find out what their gift is so they can start using it. Because if you don't know what your gift is or what God has given you, you won't be able to use it. But here's a problem. There are a lot of people who are afraid to do what God wants. I remember in the military, there was a lot of cowards when there would be, uh, you know, automatic weapons firing at you or over your head and you had to move. Sometimes guys wouldn't move. And I can say this now because I'm not in the military. I tell them, if you don't get your butt moving, I'm going to shoot you. I'll shoot you dead right here and I will leave you. I would tell them that and they didn't believe me. And I would shoot at them. And the next one would go into them and I meant it. Fortunately, I never had to shoot one of my own friends, but I would have because if it comes down to my life or yours because you're too lazy to crawl and try to get under the fire because they can't hit you at certain. Anyway, a lot of guys would get afraid and they would freeze or they would hole up or they would pretend they're not actually in a war. I've seen guys shut down, their eyes glaze over and you'd think they're watching a movie. Everybody reacts differently. But you know, Charles Spurgeon made a statement and he made it in the end of his days. Because see, he suffered for two years, horribly. They said he would cry so loud that they would leave the house. God doesn't give us a spirit of fear. And when you believe the plan of God is going to be real and that God is real and he is God and that you can trust fully in him and he has a plan, you won't be afraid. Charles Spurgeon said, the man that believes wholeheartedly in the plan of God has no fear of what happens to him, regardless of what happens to him, because he knows it's a part of the plan of God. <clears throat> My mother would say, what's going to be is going to be, son. You just have to trust God. And she was right. You see, God has given you gifts, but he has not given us the spirit of fear. There is a spirit of fear. This is the name of an entity. And when the spirit of fear comes upon somebody, it makes them freeze. It makes them hesitant. It makes them question what they're going to do. Well, you know, my friend, if you've got a Bible, you don't have to question your lifestyle because you'll know whether it's wrong or right. And you are going to sin, but you're also going to want to do good and allow God to use you for good. It just matters which person you surrender yourself to, yourself, the world, or the devil, or God. But know this, if you're afraid, it is not from God. God does not give you the spirit of fear, but what does he give you? He gives you the first of power. Now, <clears throat> this isn't just power, it's explosive power. It's not power so you can slowly wrestle a giant down to the ground. No, it's power so you can pop him in the head with a 50 caliber and he drops. It's when people run into Bigfoot or wolves or bears and they say, I shot him four or five times. Why don't you do a headshot? Go for the eye, go for the mouth. You see, a soldier goes for the headshot. God doesn't give you a spirit of fear, but one of power. And this means explosion. It means it'll happen all at once. Do you realize you may be witnessing somebody that's been witnessed to for 40 years. They may be getting in the light, what we call the gray years of their life. Their candle is burning out. But you know what? I have led many people to salvation just days before they died. As a soldier, you're going to have a target that God is going to put on your, on your mind. And that target means you're supposed to go and tell them the gospel of Jesus Christ. How, though they are in sins, Christ died for them. And he rose from the grave to give them everlasting life. 
Or maybe you're over there to take like that soldier that's frozen and grab him by the hand and say, listen, you see, this is the gift of exhortation. I know you're afraid. I know you're beaten down. You feel like nobody loves you. Come on, Jonah, let me help you get back on track. And you pull him by the hand and say, let's get back in there and get the job done. You see, God gives you power. And that means he lets you do what you can do. But then he's going to just command and boom, the Holy Spirit's going to open their eyes. They're going to say, wow, I wish I would have always been a Christian. Why didn't I cry out for salvation before? Or all of a sudden they've got a new inspiration and a new breath and a fresh wind so they can go back to doing the things they were doing. Sometimes a catastrophic happening occurs. Somebody loses a loved one. Somebody loses a child. And it thwarts them. It puts them in that foxhole where they're frozen up, where they've given up. Because I'll be honest. I, I, I'll be honest. When I had to crawl once, there were bullets flying pretty doggone close to me. I wasn't a Christian. I wasn't even praying to God. I was just moving quicker. I was hoping that I didn't get hit, but I kept moving. Now I had a, an E5 that said if I didn't get the men over that that hill and into that valley, he'd shoot me, and he would have. That's why I parlayed it onto my men. You see, God gives you the spirit of power, but He doesn't do it like an unsaved man that says, "I'm going to shoot you if you don't move it." He does it like Jesus, with love. This is the word agapeo. Um, there's three tenses to this word, and this one means they're unable to do it. You do it for them. It's like the person that's too weak to feed themselves, so you feed them. We'll do it for a baby bird. Won't we put water in their mouth or a puppy? We'll put a, a baby bottle in their mouth or a kitty. We'll take care of them. But when we see a human down... We tend to say, you know what, they deserved it, tough luck. But that's not how it happens. You see, when the power of God works, the only thing that will set that dynamite off is love. If you try to use the gifts God's given you in a hateful or a mean spirit, it ain't going to be nothing but the devil. You're going to make them hate God more. You'll make them push away from Christianity. I had an individual who says, you had no idea. Matter of fact, I just got another threatening one yesterday. I was up in the middle of the night reading it. A person telling me that I have no idea what I'm talking about. I've never met a real warlock. Trust me, I know all about Satanism and the occult from personal experience. But thank God he saved my soul and gave me a new insight. Friends, we wage a warfare, but not according to the flesh. Our warfare is according to the Spirit of God. That's from the book of Corinthians. God has given each one of us sitting here. If you are in Christ Jesus, no matter where you are, you have been given gifts of the Holy Spirit. But you're not supposed to let the world beat you down or get afraid of what anyone would think about you. Put in remembrance. Do you remember how you were when you got saved, where you didn't care what anybody thought about you? You were so happy that you would chase you would, you would have ran at the hell itself with a squirt gun and tried to put the fires out coming through the gate to save a soul when you got saved. Everybody that's truly born again knows the conversion experience. Put that back into your memory, how God saved you, delivered you. And now that explosive power is waiting to change somebody else. But it has to be administered in the spirit of love, not hatred, but also of a sound mind. Now this is what's interesting. I've been getting a lot of entertainment, and it's sinful, from a specific church whose pastor is known nationwide. Because I'm a sinful man, but I love it when this pastor will say, let the spirit move, and then all of a sudden he starts river dancing. And then everybody on the stage starts river dancing. And then you can tell who the visitors are because the spirit didn't touch them. And they're sitting there looking around like, what's going on as all these people are doing the same type of dance that the pastor's doing? And I thought to myself, well, if you like the disco and 
jitterbug. That's the church for you. Problem is, that's entertainment, folks. That's not the Lord, and that's not the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the works of the devil. See, it's a charlatan. That's entertainment. That is not a sound mind. You see, a sound mind means one that knows the facts and says, you know, I really don't care if it makes me feel good or if something's trying to control me. I better find out what it is that is trying to control me, right? I had my wife sitting here as a witness. I had an elder from a church sitting at the table with his wife, and out of nowhere he comes up off the table and says he wants to fight me. I'm chewing my salad. I finished swallowing. I said, I command you to be bound. What is your name? And out of his mouth and hers, Beelzebub came. Well, they were both charismatic. So I said, Lord, show him when it came in. It came in through the laughing spirit and the laying out of hands. We fell to the floor and was slain the spirit. That was Beelzebub. That wasn't God. You see, a sound mind is somebody that says this is the way it is. And the truth of the matter is, is God made us in his image. He gave us a plan. And our great ancestor Adam said, you know what, Lord? I don't care about that. I want what I want. See, Adam, if you read the Hebrew, he looked God in the face and sinned. Why? Nobody had ever been punished before. Nobody had ever been disciplined before. Nobody had ever... He had never felt pain before. <laughs> Could you imagine never feeling pain? Adam had never felt anything but pure peace and bliss. So how bad could it be? Get me a honk and piece of that fruit, woman. I'm coming to you. Sure, my good friend Snakey. He's petting that big old serpent that's wrapped around him, loving on him. You're going to love it, Adam. We're going to be best friends. Did the Lord really say don't eat that fruit? How bad could it be? What is death anyway? He says you shall both surely die. What does that mean? There's never been a plant die. What do you think they find all those stumps so big all around the world? And they're all spaced out about 125 miles apart. And they found that the limbs are over two miles long. That is the canopy that surrounded the earth. Those trees were created at full height. Friends, do you understand? Sin will make you lose your mind. It will make you think things that are not true. This is one of the, and when we wrote the first prayer, I was at the International Center of Biblical Counselors before, uh, back when it was the International School, before it became that. And when they were writing the prayers, and, and this is why I have them in my little book of prayers, the first thing we would write is to renounce all the lies of the devil. Because the devil will make you believe things, make you believe you've heard things. Make you believe you've seen things that are not real. That's the power of sin. So, how do we know we have a sound mind? The word sound here, it means one that is solid and cannot be moved. One of the things that they would do when they would check ships is they had a guy who would go and tap them with a small metal thing. And he would go and tap the hull all the way around and he would know if it was a sound ship. If it gave an uncertain sound, you had to check it out and find out why. Because you didn't want to get out on the open sea and find out they had ran out of glue and for two feet of space they didn't glue the shipboard. They just thought it would be held on by the swelling of the water. That would be a fatal mistake for everybody. So friends, First, you need to stir up and remember from whence you have been saved. Secondly, don't let fear get a grip of you. But if you believe in the plan of God and the power of God, you can minister to others with love and of a sound mind from the scriptures. But what else? How many people are ashamed that they are a Christian? This is really the younger people's problem, mostly. But I've seen older people do it. You know, to where they're afraid you're going to discuss it. Before my mom got saved, if she had friends over or something, and my dad and I would go up there, or a family, she'd say, oh, there's the religious nut. And she'd throw her chair back and throw her hands up and say, what do you want here? Why are you here? That's the way my mother treated me after I got saved. She did not like me. She did not want me around. Why? Because they would have all their card games and their drinking and 
you know, there'd be guns on the table. My family was partiers. Well, then, people started getting saved. You see, my mom was ashamed of me when I became a Christian. My sister began calling me Mr. Milktoast out loud in front of everybody. And she would walk up and slap me and say, see, he won't hit me back. That was my sister Susan. He's a milk toast. Well, no, I was a Christian and I was a very nice person, but that's how evil my sister was. I would pray for her salvation and I would witness to her. Look at verse eight, be therefore, be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. But be thou the partaker of the afflictions of the gospel, according, and this means down through the purpose of God. You see, this is what most people don't understand, is if you are suffering an affliction, when it says according to, it means God put you in that place for that specific reason, to be basically used. A sheep for the slaughter. A catalyst that's going to get burned up but it will produce the effect. In other words, your comfort is not on the top of God's list here. It's his glory. And he said, Jesus himself said, if you're ashamed of him, when the day comes and you stand in front of him, he'll be ashamed of you. And he'll say, cast that person into outer darkness where there's a weeping and a wailing and a gnashing of teeth because they, they cared more for themselves, the world, or their own reputation than to tell the truth. You see, why is it important that we're not ashamed of Jesus? Because we have got to be bold. Paul was not only not ashamed, he said that's the only thing he had pride in, was in the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the only thing he was happy and proud of, was what God had done for us and included us in it. You see, he has saved us, and he's called us with a holy calling. Verse 9, not according to our works. In other words, he didn't save us so now that we can be happy when we build our homes or stake out our property or we start putting money into our banking system or we start investing in that nice, cool robe so the other Pharisees will know we're a part of the group. I have seen churches, I've been in churches, not as the pastor, but visiting, to where poor people would come in and get saved and they would basically take them aside and disciple them and they would tell them they had to buy dresses and suits. Some of these people were not even able to put food on the table or on a regular basis, you know, just trying to keep the power on. Church didn't offer to buy them those clothes, basically told them they'd have to start changing. Isn't it interesting how they want to get you saved, but after they get saved, they want you to change and become like them? How many pairs of clothes did Jesus have? That's right, he didn't even have a single one. The thing he was wearing was given to him, and that was taken from him. Friends, people that are ashamed of the gospel do this. They keep the sword of the Spirit from ever penetrating the heart of those around them. God has given you a sword to swing, and it is to circumcise and cut the hearts of those around you. You see, when the heart is circumcised, that is when it is taken from an Adam Antium, hardest nether rock state and then is made flesh so it can feel so it can live breathe you see God saved us and he called us with a holy calling the word holy here it means to be separate unto him he calls you and you leave the rest that's what it means there's a whole group of, of people over there he called you by name and holy means he separated you for himself. Not according to our works. It's not to help us do our own thing here on earth and live a better life. But actually, it's according to his purpose. He's got a plan for you and his grace. Which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Let that sink in. God created you. It says in the Psalms, he knew you before he created you. He even wrote down all the little parts of your body, like your hair follicles, how many there would be, whether your arteries would be thick or thin. He designed you. 
And he designed you to use you later on with a purpose. He chose you for salvation. He gave you a gift. You are now on the battlefield. The battlefield is earth. We are battling for the souls of men and women. And I'm going to tell you, this battle is hard. Why? Because the devil will work through music. He will give you the most beautiful music and people to sing and comfort you. Except it won't be about Jesus. It'll be about books. He'll give you all the entertainment you can read, and captivate your mind, and keep you going for hours, just salivating for that next page. But it won't be about Jesus. It won't be against Jesus. It just won't be for Jesus. But you see, if you haven't chosen for Jesus, but you're not against him, you're against him. He that is not for us is against us. He that is for us is not against us. We saw somebody preaching in your name, Lord, and we forbid him. He did not sit under your feet. He doesn't know what you teach. No. Why? Because I created him in mine image. I knew him before I created him, before the world began. And he is filling a blank that you're not. I called him and I gave him the gift to preach and teach. He that not against us is for us. That is rhetoric, and in the Greek it means, though, he that is not for us is against us. It's called rhetoric. You can't sit on the sidelines. You see, you were given a ministry before the world began. The key is, is do you know what that ministry is? Verse 10, we're going to finish with this. He says, it is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and has brought us life and mortality to light through the gospel. You say, well, Pastor Tom, I don't, I don't know my gift. I did a series on the internet on gifts. You can look them up, wrote books on it. But here's the deal. He says, it shall be made manifest. And what this means is your gift will be made known to you and everybody else by the way you act. Like I was telling my daughter, you'll know a coon hound because you won't have to tell it to chase cats. That little puppy, as soon as he gets outside, will see a cat three times bigger than him, and he'll run over and try to get it. Why? He's a coon hound. It's in his nature. You don't have to tell a banana tree to produce bananas. You just got to give it time. And after seven years, you'll have good bananas growing. Why? It's in its nature. And when you have been truly born again, God has made you a new creation and he has given you gifts. And what your desires are by the Spirit of God will be your gifts. You see, I honestly did not want to be a preacher. I wanted to be in construction. I wanted to live on a farm. But I wanted to study the Word of God, and I didn't want any irritation, so I would lock myself in the bathroom for two hours at a time so I could study. I couldn't get enough of the Bible. That's manifestation of the gift. A pastor will not be able to read enough of the Bible. Um, I multitask all the time. I'm very ashamed that I play video games. It's in my blood. I confess it. I can't break the habit. But because I'm a multitasker, I'm also reading the Bible and doing three or four other things at the same time. Friends, God has given you gifts. Don't be afraid to use them. But actually, love somebody enough to start using your gifts to build them up, to bless them, just to be encouraging, to give to them in their time of need, to be merciful. Why does somebody need mercy? you never been caught doing something wrong? And then everybody rail on you or kick on you or turn you in? That person needs mercy. Right? I know I've needed it many times. There have been times I haven't gotten it. Be merciful. Somebody makes a mistake, don't say it. <laughs> I had a deacon at the first church I was in, and I went to visit a woman, and she was dying. She had no medication. She was a charter member. Her and her husband had picked out the ground to put the church on. I visited her. She was in a and I'm not exaggerating. She was living in a shack. And um, when I went out there and her daughter, you know, they're all, that's basically the only person that with her. And they couldn't even afford the prescription she needed. I went out and bought it and gave it to her. Went out and got them groceries. 
Next week I go in, she's sitting up. They've got the IVs off of her. She's talking. Took her more groceries, bought her another prescription. She came to church three weeks later. One was dying because she couldn't afford the medicine to keep her heart working. And so I went to the two deacons, both who would take the ties and pour them in their wife's purse each week and go home to count them. And the one deacon looked at me and said, that's her own fault. We're not going to help her. I said, she's a widow indeed, and that's what the church is supposed to do. He said, she's like that because she didn't buy insurance. This man just happened to be the only insurance salesman. Ed Mitchell Insurance, Plano, Illinois. He's dead now, but he's probably burning in hell. And um, he was very rich. I mean, he had his own airport several planes and strips. And he says, that's her own fault. We're not going to give a dime to her. I said, she started this church with her husband. And the other guys, you know, I said, I'll bring it before the whole church openly. Now we're running like 300 people on Sunday. I said, I'll just tell everybody what you guys have said. Ed, wretch over and slap me. I looked at him. He slapped me again. He slapped me six times in a row. I, he couldn't hurt me. Because, trust me, I like being slapped sometimes. It makes me want to hurt you, but I won't. And finally, Ken, Ken grabbed his hand. He said, Ed, quit hitting him. Well, he says, then he's no longer my pastor. We need to get rid of him. They're saying this right to my face. Well, they did get rid of me. And the way they did it was by standing outside and not letting any Hispanics in. So I quit because we had over 100 Hispanic people. What's going on here? Friends, somebody should have had the gift of mercy to help that woman. It was no fault of hers. Sure, she probably didn't eat right. She's overweight. Who isn't these days? The sound mind starts here. It says, I want to know your word. I want to know how to use what you've given me. Lord, I will not be ashamed. Send me where you will. Father, I pray and ask that you'd bless this reading of your word. Open our hearts, our minds, our souls, our spirits. Equip us. Let us learn from you, but let us be that bright and shining light. In Christ's name I do pray. We don't have the spirit of fear, but Lord, you've given us a sound mind. You've given us the love of Jesus Christ. And Lord, help us to never be ashamed, but to broadly, boldly state the truth about Jesus Christ and our own condition. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.